Yo guys, welcome to the Zelda Fiction. Today we are gonna see, what if Naruto was the tyrant emperor and got massive harem? Huge shout out to Dante Fernandez for this story. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Prologue. How long has it been? Bakashi along with Asuma and Kurinai, were leading their respective teams to the former ruins of Yuzu no Kuni. Former as in it was now rebuilt and better than it ever was. Kakashi was thinking on the events that led up to this movement. The reason why they were headed there was because they were desperate. Right now Kanoha was nothing more but a shell of its former self as its hypocrisy and dark secrets came to light. Losing practically every alliance they had, their daimyo forced to cut their funding, they were no longer the most powerful hidden village in the elemental nations, and it was safe to say that they were more like a minor village than anything else. At first they tried to solve the root of the problem by retrieving Gen and Yuzumaki Naruto, as he was banished for using unnecessary force to complete his mission, which unintentionally caused the whole thing. However Naruto seemingly disappeared with not even Jiraiya's spy network or Danzo's route being able to find him. As such they tried through other means to recover which at first involved lowering their price for mission requests, prostituting their kanoichi, hunt as many missing nin as possible, kidnapping nins from other villages for ransoms or breeding stock, and finally trying to conquer non-shinobi lands. The first did not work as it ended up showing clients how weak and desperate they are. The second did not work as many of their kanoichi were from clans, many being clan heiresses, and were unwilling to do this job because of their pride and risk having a revolt. Those that did prostitute themselves end up mentally broken beyond repair or worse being kidnapped by their clients to be used as sex slaves, with Kanoha not being able to do a thing. They tried with civilian women however all the female civilians, with the exception of A.M., Haruno Sakura and Haruno Mibuki, were mediocre at best in terms of the looks department, so were often undesirable, and when they were picked, they would oftentimes be physically abused more than actually getting any sex. A.M. and Tucci had left Kanoha ride after Naruto's banishment, Sakura being Tsunade's apprentice, prevented her from being forced to do such a demeaning job, which also protected her mother from this. The third option was practically impossible as those who were easy to target had too little of a bounty that it offered no aid to increasing their dwindling wealth. Those with bounties that can actually make a difference, like the Akatsuki, were too powerful or too clever that it was too much of a risk to hunt them down. The fourth option ended up causing them to gain way too many enemies, with Kumagakur using it to their advantage by spreading their corruption and hypocrisy to the other nations, slandering their name. The fifth failed due to a simple reason they were already conquered. It was then they discovered that Yuzu no Kuni had been restored with Yuzushi Agakur rebuilt and better than it ever was. The defenses were impenetrable and the lands were defended by special samurai that seemingly knew how to counteract every known ability, common and bloodline, that a shinobi can use, no matter what level they are, be it genin or kage. It was because of these samurai that they could not take any non-shinobi villages, however that wasn't the worst part for them. They conquered minor and few major shinobi-based lands such as Takigakur, Shangri-La, a village made specifically to house and hide those with bounties on their heads, causing many from Kanoha to curse themselves from not finding it first, Mizu no Kuni, Nami no Kuni. Yumi no Kuni, Mount Katsuragi, Kagi no Kuni, Rinkoku no Sado, Kuma no Kuni, Genjutsu Tree Village, Sara no Kuni, Haru no Kuni, Tori no Kuni and, Na no Kuni. Because of this, despite Yuzushigakur not being a shinobi village with no kage, they still have shinobi and kinoichi however they act more like assassins than glorified mercenaries that the elemental nations are used to. Besides the last three, which came into Yuzu no Kuni's rule through political marriage, every other land was conquered by killing the daimyos and kages. All of this was accomplished by one man, the daimyo of Yuzu no Kuni Odanabunaga. More demon than man, he is infamous for sheer ruthlessness and brutality, sadistic beyond measure, and is known to leave no survivors when he fights. He is known as the Beast of Vengeance, Demon King of the Sixth Heaven, Master of Pain, the Master of Conquest, Beast of No Morals, and the Tyrant King among other titles. He happens to also be infamous for betting many women, married or not, and is called the Conqueror of Women, as all of his bed warmers end up becoming his concubines, or if in a lower position, sex slaves. In all honesty all of the major shinobi villages would have tried to invade Yuzu no Kuni, if it weren't for one simple fact, they are completely and utterly terrified of Oda Nobunaga, to the point that they would rather fight all nine of the Biju at once without any weapons or chakra. Those who have managed to witness Nobunaga's exploits have all said that the legends of Nobunaga's power and savagery have all been greatly understated and that the real thing is far far worse. So why in Kami's good name are Konohan in seeking aid from someone like him? Well this involves another one of his other titles. King of Mercenaries. For some reason Nobunaga will take jobs like any other mercenary and will complete it 100%. However he only takes missions with very high pay. 
In order to make a request they must send a message to one of Yuzu's island posts, in which once Nobunaga receives the message he will decide whether the mission is interesting, and if it was then the client was allowed to enter Yuzu no Kuni and meet with Nobunaga himself, where they can present the pay in their case. If he does not think it's worth it then he forces them to leave as soon as possible, lest they get killed by the bored warlord. Inoha had run out of options and despite their fears and bad relations, due in part that they tried to take some of his sex slaves, thinking he won't care as breeding stock, they had no choice but to seek his aid as Iwa, Kumo, and Odo have joined together to take out Kanoha, while Suna refuses to aid them. Imagine everyone's shock when Nobunaga found their request interesting enough that he's willing to hear them out and invite them to his palace. So here Kakashi was leading a group Jonin and Chunin to their possible doom. He looked back to see Kurinai who looked like she had swallowed a very bitter pill no doubt, due to learning about Nobunaga's harem, Asuma, who looked calm yet was sweating bullets, Sayu glaring harshly at Sai with his fake smile, while the rest of the female members looking frightened beyond belief, most likely afraid Nobunaga will forcefully take them for himself. It honestly didn't help that when they first entered, the first thing they saw were the skewered corpses of Nin that tried to infiltrate these lands. Despite walking the streets filled with happy citizens, which surprised everyone considering the warlord's reputation, guided by one of his samurais Kakashi felt that he was basically being guided by the Grim Reaper. Still he can't help but feel guilty at the fact that he was visiting this place without his former student Naruto, the origin of his clan. Eventually the group was led to the palace where a young woman in her adolescent years with a buxom figure, long black blue hair that extends all the way down to her hips with several bangs hanging over her forehead and side bangs that frame her face, and violet eyes greets them. She wears a set of revealing samurai-like armor, consisting of a black chest plate with scarlet red accents and wide, detached sleeves, a blue and white obi, a scarlet hair bow, and black thigh-eye boots. The chest plate opening at her breasts, giving view to her cleavage. What shocked Kakashi and the rest were the pair of white cat ears on top of her head and the two white tails swaying behind her. There was only one being that he could think of that had those features. Nibi. Kakashi was trying to think of answers of how the Nibi Biju ended up here and how it somehow gained a, admittedly hot, human form. After all the Nibi Jinchuriki had gone missing a while back and was presumed Kia. The day Kanohanin, my name is Oda Himari, the leader of the samurai factions and third wife of Oda Nobunaga. Wait Oda Himari. Third wife man Kumo is going to throw a hissy fit when they find out about this. Though hopefully they won't be as prideful as Konoha and try to steal their biju back. If Nobunaga rips people's manhoods just for harming his sex slaves then he honestly did not even want to think about what will happen to any poor suckers that would try to harm an actual wife of Nobunaga. Thank you. My name is Hot Aki Kakashi, and this is Saratobi Asuma and Iki Kurinai, along with our team Sai, Ichiha Saya, Haruno Sakura, Akamichi Choji, Nara Shikamaru, Yamanaka Ino, Abu Rami Shino, Inyazuka Kiba and his Ninkan Akamura, and Haika Hinata. Each one, at their names being called, bowed to her in respect. Himari meanwhile looked amused. Why you sure have such a large number of people in your group despite being for a simple request? Yes well forgive me if I offend you, but considering your husband's reputation well, I feel like this is actually an inadequate number. Amari giggled in amusement. I understand and you have the right to be cautious and fearful, though it's not like it will make much of a difference. She nodded at the samurai who bowed before leaving. Follow me and mind your manners. She led them into the palace which much like any other daimyos it showed off just how rich he is yet at the same time showing off how powerful he is, considering the place was decorated with war trophies. The halls were also filled with beautiful women wearing quite revealing clothing, much to the men's joy, and they could easily guess they were Nobunaga's concubines and sex slaves. It was also clear which was which as the sex slaves wore practically no clothing at all and had leashes that were occasionally pulled by the concubines to show their higher positions. However both groups had collars around their necks. The Kashi can practically hear Kurinai's teeth grinding against each, and he prayed to Kami that she will not start an incident, oftentimes Kurinai can get overboard when it comes to her feminist views. Enko. Startled he, Hinata and Asuma turned to Kurinai in concern before looking at the direction she was staring, and were shocked. They're serving tea to three concubines, one of them being the former rebel leader of Kiri, Terumi Mei, was Mitarshi Anko, herself a former Kanoichi of Kanoha. But apparently now she was a part of Nobunaga's harem, and judging from her attire, she was a mere sex slave. Bakashi and Asuma instantly grabbed hold of Kurinai preventing her from going over to Anko's side. Let go of me. She struggled against them. Kurinai you know we can't. For now we have absolutely no choice but to leave her. What? She sounded outraged. Asuma decided to say his piece. Kurinai I know how you feel about this and I know how you feel guilty for what happened to her all those years ago. 
If it was any other situation I would let you go on a rampage however this is Nobunaga's territory, do you really want to risk our daughter becoming motherless? At this Kurunai flinched. Though Anko was her best friend, she had to think of her family first and foremost. Don't worry. If this works out perhaps we can set up some sort of deal for Anko's freedom. Is something the matter? The three were snapped out of their conversation as Hamari looked at them questioningly, though one can see the hardness in her eyes and her tightening her grip around her sword. Nothing nothing at all. Kurunai spat out. But then let's keep going. The group once more followed Hamari. As they kept passing every concubine and every sex slave the more the girls became afraid, while Kurunai seemed to get angrier. Although Kiba was staring at them lustfully all the while cursing Nobunaga for his luck. The group then came across a person that caused the shinobi to pale in fright and for Team 7 to stare horrified. In front of the group was a fiendish woman of immaculate beauty with a voluptuous body, wide hips, large breasts, long dark pink hair, orange pigmentation around her eyes, the eyes themselves being slit crimson, and wearing revealing clothing that emphasized her beauty. However what caused the shinobi to be horrified was the long orange fox ears on top of her head, and the nine long orange fox tails swing behind her. This was without a doubt the QB no Kitsune. The Kashi sensei that's the. I know Sakura, I know. After Naruto's banishment Tsunade had deemed a time to tell the younger generation of shinobi about Naruto's burden curse. She was pleasantly surprised to see that they could tell the difference between the container and the beast itself, hell even Sakura despite being from a civilian family, was smart enough not to mistake the two as one and the same. However the fact that QB is right in front of them completely free. The Kashi then widened his eyes and looked at Saya in concern. Saya looked more horrified than anyone else combined. In the past Saya and Naruto were the best of friends, and to others, it was obvious that the two were deeply in love with each other, however after the whole Ichiha clan massacre, she practically severed the bond the two had, and treated him like a nuisance. However their time as a genin team eventually caused her to open up to him again, and seemed like two were going to repair that broken bond, although everything changed when Orochimaru gave Saya his curse mark things became worse, and the way she treated him was even worse than when they were still in the academy. He also knew that something bad had happened between the two when Naruto came back with her, as Naruto sported the most broken look he had ever seen in his entire life. When Saya had woken up the first thing he saw in her eyes was pure regret and the first thing she asked was where was Naruto. When it was revealed what happened to him she fell into a deep state of depression, and it was only by telling her that if she grew stronger the higher the chance she can find Naruto, that she was able to snap out of her funk. She no longer cared about vengeance or justice for her clan. It was only the hope of finding Naruto and reconnecting their bond that kept her truly going. But now. Oni Sama what are you doing? Amari asked. The way she just referred to the fox maiden had confirmed their fears. Oh nothing much Amato chan I just have a sort of itch in a certain area that I was hoping our dear husband can scratch. Husband? Oh fuck. This just keeps getting worse and worse. Well you might have to wait a while since these Kanohanin have a meeting with him. QB looked amused at this and then took a look at the group. When her gaze landed on Hinata they seemed to take some sort of combination of pity and mocking, with Saya, it was a combination of disdain, hate and gloating. Hinata felt as if she lost a battle, yet had no idea why while well, Saya felt jealousy and the urge to stick a Chidori through the fox woman's chest though like Hinata, she had no idea why. Well since these are Kanohanin, then the meeting will be pretty short, so you're welcome to join us. That was not a good sign. Seems people were onto something when they claim he can hold a grudge. Why thank you, I think I may take you up on that offer. The group were once more on their way. The Kashi contemplated on whether to ask QB the whereabouts of his missing student Naruto. If anyone would know what happened to Naruto it would be QB herself and maybe Oda Nobunaga. Excuse me QB. QB turned her attention to Kakashi. Yes. Here Kakashi had to be careful since he knew the fox would probably kill him for saying something that might offend her, which would probably be easy since QB had been sealed by Kanoha three times and treated like a mass weapon of destruction. I was wondering, since you were most likely the last person to see Naruto. QB narrowed his eyes at him. Do you perhaps know where he is? QB grinned at him, which had a sadistic quality to it that caused him to feel a large amount of dread. You'll just have to ask Nobunaga about your former student's fate. Few minutes earlier. Inside Nobunaga's private room there was sounds of moans and cries of pleasure. Gripping the sheets tightly while on all fours was a woman with long crimson hair, a voluptuous body with a pair of large breasts, swaying to each pounding, while leaking copious amounts of milk, and her large ass cheeks making a slapping sound at each thrust. There was also a collar around her neck and a leash to show that she was a sex slave. 
Her master, Oda Nobunaga, was what could be described as a beautiful man with long shaggy crimson hair, reminiscent to a lion's mane, and a very lean body, yet with clear muscles to show his strength, and covered with black stripes, similar to a tiger's. His face however was overshadowed by his hair, leaving only his eyes to appear, which were a deep crimson color with gray sclera, eyes that were now full of lust and love for the woman he was making love to. They had been going at it for hours judging from the sweat and all the sexual fluid staining the bedsheets. Suddenly he pulled her leash, forcing her up, allowing him to kiss her deeply, while squeezing her breasts hard enough to leave large hand-shaped marks and to cause it to squirt out more milk. All the woman could do was moan in pleasure, her bright purple eyes full of lust and love for her master, as her arms hanged limply, as her entire body became numb and felt only pleasure. One of his hands let go of her breasts and instantly pinched her clit, causing her to scream in his mouth as she came hard once more yet that did not deter him in the slightest. Eventually he ended the kiss and looked into his slave's eyes. I'm close my dear. Her eyes widened in sheer excitement. But the loud roar that sounded more beast than man as came directly into her womb causing her to scream as she came again. The two now were cuddling lovingly as the slave was utterly spent and looked to be on the verge of unconsciousness. Nobunaga was not in the least bit tired, although he knew if he continued on she would completely and utterly break. Oda-sama. The concubine came into his room. There's no need for formalities Yakumo-chan. Whether you're my wife, concubine, or sex slave in the end you are all diamonds in this world of mine and should be treated as such. Even though there was a large difference to how he treated each harem member depending on their status, he treats them well and with great kindness, all while spoiling them greatly to the point that every girl ends up falling for him and cares not for what position they are in as long as they could be with him. The concubine, now named Yakumo, blushed at the compliment. Even so Millard I am just a mere concubine, so I must treat you with the proper respect you deserve. He simply rolled his eyes in exasperation though held an affectionate loving smile for her. The Kanohenin have arrived Millard. His eyes widened and then narrowed, his smile instantly changed to a malicious grin. Well best not keep them waiting. Just as he was about to stand up, an arm shot forward and grabbed him. Matt let me come with you. Are you sure? You're extremely exhausted right now, along with if I show them to you the way you are right now it will hurt a lot of people. The woman smiled which seemed to have a sadistic gleam to it. That's the idea. Present. Amari, QB, and the Kanohanin have arrived at the throne room, where sitting on the throne was Oda Nobunaga himself wearing a tiger skin belt over a black hakama, while his upper body was left bare. Everyone was surprised to see just how young he looked, no older than the rookie 12, however his eyes told a completely different story, it was the eyes of a beast, a demon who would slaughter the innocent and guilty alike with a smile of joy on his face. Many of Kanoichi of the group blushed at the sight of him yet if you were to call out Saya on it, she would deny it harshly. If they didn't know any better they would have thought they had met QB's identical male twin, although despite this, he reminded the group of a tiger instead of a fox, due to him being covered in black stripes, three noticeable ones on each cheek. However what got the Kanohanin's attention was the red-haired beauty laying her head on the man's lap, with the only enough clothing to cover her chest and crutch. Judging from her state she had just recently enjoyed the pleasures of Nobunaga's body. Tiba would have perved on the red-haired bombshell while cursing Nobunaga's name, except he instantly noticed his sensei's expression, which was that of complete horror greater than when they first discovered the fox in Anko. The sumo also sported the same expression and Kakashi even collapsed, which instantly sent alarm bells ringing in his head, telling him that something was very wrong, and it involved the slave. He may perhaps be the dumbest nin in his generation, yet he more than made up for it with insanely good instincts. What's the matter hot Aki? You look like you've seen a ghost. His voice was musical and caused the girls to shiver, yet there was a beastly demonic undertone to it that made it sound sinister. Bakashi raised his head, and for a brief second his eye was full of unbridled hatred, one for himself and the other for the warlord, before disappearing. I'm I'm sorry Oda-sama it's just that woman reminded me of someone I once knew. Both Asuma and Kurinai threw him an unreadable glance before turning their attention back Nobunaga. Nobunaga's grin simply grew at the statement. The red-haired woman opened her eyes, revealing her to be awake all this time, smiling at the group slightly before snuggling deeper into Nobunaga's lap, causing Kakashi's fist to tighten. Nothing to apologize hot Aki, although I would appreciate if you and the others would stop eyeing my woman. It wasn't a request. It was a threat. So according to the request your gone Daime sent me Kanoha is on the brink of war with Kumo, Iwa and Odo, with no allies whatsoever and with no resources to spare, Kanoha is essentially laying on its deathbed. The group flinched at the truth, while QB, Himari, and the red-haired slave smiled in amusement. So give me a reason why I should accept this job when you virtually have nothing left to give. The Kashi bowed at the warlord. 
Please Oda-sama if you were to accept this mission not only will you have strong allies, we will also pay you a large sum of money. Taking out a scroll he unsealed the contents revealing a chest full of money. Nobunaga simply chuckled in amusement. Is this really all Kanoha can offer me? Meager savings and an alliance with weak people. Nobunaga stood up, causing the red-haired woman to pout and walk towards them. Does it look like money is an issue here? He gestured to the entire room. Does it look like my kingdom is weak? I have conquered the western lands with nothing but my two hands, and now in these eastern lands I have conquered almost every country and village this land has to offer, and even killed the Mizukage on my own, along with defeating three Biju with my own power. Even the most arrogant Kage fears my name. Though he was smiling one could tell he was pissed. And besides. He was now behind Kakashi, causing the group to jump as they hadn't even sensed him move. Why settle for an alliance when conquest is so much better? Kakashi had no answer for this, and not only have they insulted him with subpar rewards, but they may have also set him loose on Kanoha to bring its absolute demise. Please Oda-sama, though Kanoha is a shadow of its former self, there are still innocent people living there. If you do not accept this at least provide those people sanctuary as unlike most of us they at least deserve redemption. Nobunaga raised an eyebrow and something flashed in his eyes before quickly disappearing. He was once on his throne with his slave's head on his lap, seemingly teleporting there as no one saw any movement. In two weeks' time I will visit your Gon Daimei to solidify a deal with her. Everyone's eyes widen in shock. They didn't think Nobunaga will actually accept the request. His wives and slave frowned in displeasure yet made no comment. And you don't have to complain about the time as just hearing that I'll be arriving will cause those armies to cease their assault for the time being. His eyes harden into a glare causing the Kanoha group to flinch in fear. Now please leave my home right now as just being near you people is making me nauseous, and any longer I might just kill you all. The Kanoha group shivered and turned to leave quickly, Kakashi realizing that he will not be getting any answers to the whereabouts of Naruto. Matt. Shit. He completely forgot about Saya. Before anyone could stop her she was now in front of Nobunaga glaring at him with her Sharingan active. What is it you want to chair? It's about Uzumaki Naruto what happened to him. Uzumaki Naruto. He seemed confused which angered Saya. Don't play dumb with me. The fact that you have QB of all beings as your wife proves that you encountered him before, so tell me where is Naruto. The look of realization passed Nobunaga's face. Ah, you mean the former QB Jinchuriki Saya clenched her fist in anger. Tell me little girl. He grinned a sadistic grin. What happens to a Jinchuriki when their biju is set free? Saya narrowed her eyes in confusion and thought before widening in horror and realization. The rest of her group also came to the same conclusion. No. If you're also wondering then yes I was directly responsible for unsealing my wife from her prison. Bastard. Nobunaga instantly grabbed Saya's hand as she attempted to use a Chidori on him with inhuman speed before grabbing her neck chalking her. Both Hamari and QB instantly stopped the others from aiding Saya. You know despite my reputation I really don't like killing women as I find it to be a huge waste. His hand tightened around her neck causing her to chalk. However I think the Achiha bitch will be one of the few exceptions. Ignoring the pleas from Kakashi and the others he got to work on slowly crushing her throat. Despite the pain and lack of air Saya continued to glare at Nobunaga with sheer hatred yet to his slight surprise he also saw complete despair, not for her execution, but for someone else. Suddenly Nobunaga let go of Saya, a look of complete shock passed his face before being replaced with a neutral look. Saya on the ground coughed a few times before glaring at Nobunaga with anger and confusion. Leave now. He yelled out aiming a high dosage of his kai at the group, causing them all to have a near heart attack. Matt. Saya once more tried to go after him, only for Kakashi grab her and give her a stern glare. We will talk more of this later Saya. The group disappeared in a shunshin. As the group were heading back to Kanoha Kakashi had time to gather his thoughts. In truth he was barely holding it in. He just wanted to collapse on the ground and cry his eyes out or go back in there and kill that monster. The student that he had neglected, the son of his sensei who he saw as a father, dead, killed by the hands of someone who truly deserved to be called demon. Worse still the woman he viewed as a big sister turned out be alive, was mentally broken and turned into a mere bed warmer for that thing. Kakashi you do know we will have to report everything we saw back there right? Kurunai asked. Bakashi flinched knowing it true and the drama that will come from it. Bakashi sensei who was that woman? Sakura asked him. When you guys looked at her I saw recognition from your faces, and not only that she also looked familiar to us Chunin, even though we've never seen her before. I'm guessing that she was some high-profiling Kinoichi of Kanoha at some point. Saya stated. Bakashi glanced at the other Jonin asking them if they should tell them. The three came to an agreement that they should tell them. 
they kept a lot of secrets from the younger generation, and all that's done is cause problems in both the short and long run. That woman was a former high-ranking Anbu, infamous for her fuinjutsu skills, and to her enemies she's known as the Scarlet Death. I believe she was good friends with your mother Saya. Saya seemed surprised to hear that she knew her mother and shared a similar title. As well she was the Yandai Mei's wife and the second QP Jinchuriki. Everyone looked at him in shock. Second Jinchuriki. Hinata questioned in a whisper. Her name is Yuzumaki Kashina, and she is the mother of Yuzumaki Naruto. Oda Nobunaga sat in his throne staring at the spot the Konohan in one stood seemingly in thought. Nobu-chan is there a reason why you decided to accept their request, especially with what they've done to us? Despite saying that the woman, now revealed to be named Kashina, sounded curious more than anything else. You should know Kasan. He stood up from his room and was walking back to his private quarters with Kashina, Kyupi and Himari following him. I will always go for conquest and nothing less. He smiled quite demonically. He was completely exhausted. Bodies littered the ground, all of them shinobi, all of them wearing featureless masks. His blonde hair was covered in so much blood that it looked naturally red. His clothes were torn revealing his skinny pale white flesh, his eyes a cold grayish blue, while his cheeks bore scars resembling the stripes of a tiger. Boy. He turned around to see a group of armed soldiers at the front a samurai wearing crimson armor. Some of them were bloodied, showing that they also took part in this massacre. The samurai approached the bloody child. You did all this. Despite the wording, it sounded more like a statement. Yet he still answered with a nod. What is your name boy? The child frowned in thought, the more he thought about it, the more it escaped him. I don't know I don't know who I am. The samurai raised an eyebrow curiously. He wondered if, along the way, the boy had lost himself. Boy, I can see you bear the stigma of a shinobi he gestured to the bloody kunai and the hit I ate. Yet I also see in your eyes that you bear the mark of a warrior. Get rid of your stigma. He tossed the kunai away yet hesitated when he glanced at the symbol on the hit I ate. A very small part him told him not to, yet every time he looked at it, he felt nothing but despair, rage and hatred, with each emotion growing stronger the longer he looked. Crack. The samurai was pleasantly surprised when the child crushed the hit I ate into pieces instead. Come. He started following the samurai as the group moved out. From now on you are my son, and from henceforth your name shall be Nobunaga. Despite seeing great promise in his new son, he would never have guessed that he was looking at the future demon king of the world. I hope you'll forgive me for asking dear husband. Nobunaga was currently laying on his bed with QB, Himari and Kashina, who for some reason wasn't wearing her slave attire, which included the slave collar and leash, after a steamy night of love making. What is it Yasin Chan? He addressed QB. But what exactly do you plan to do to the leaf? Nobunaga chuckled softly. Tell me my first wife. He could feel Kishina and Himari pout in jealousy at the reminder that Yasin is the first wife and is the one who holds most sway of his heart out of all the wives, concubines and sex slaves he has. Though in all honesty they couldn't really blame her, after all she has always been there for him even at his birth and was the one who heard say his first words and saw him take his first steps. She was the one to see him at his lowest and the one to bring him to the heavens. Have you ever heard of the Trojan horse? Yasin frowned in thought before shaking her head. Nobunaga chuckled. It's a very simple yet very effective move, one that will leave our enemies with absolutely nothing. But the quick movement he was on top of her already plunging deep into her warm depths, causing her to moan in pleasure. He leaned down and whispered in her ear. But ashes and blood. Before claiming her lips. He sat up while still clinging onto her, causing her to yelp. The two stopped kissing in order to catch their breath. You're insatiable my beloved. Whether she was talking about his lust or his desire to conquer everything was debatable. Yasin squeaked when Himari and Kashina grabbed her breasts. When he saw me you are being greedy. Yeah. After all we are his wives as well. Not just you. They then started suckling her breasts, causing her to moan and squirm around Nobunaga's manhood. They grinned at the display before once more claiming her lips. Order of K's no kuni two days later. Traveling through the large fields of sand was Team Guy, which feature Mido Guy, Haikaniji, Rock Lee, and Tenten, their mission was to find out what happened to a Rujanbu squad. Four days ago a team was out on the mission yet they ended up going into silence, their last known location was at the border of Kei's no Kuni, even though it was straying from their current mission. They were on the case due to teammate not being available as well as Niji being a Huga, this automatically made them the best choice for tracking. They would have sent some more experienced shinobi specialized in tracking, yet they couldn't afford to thin out their forces for something that most would consider trivial. So here they were with Niji in the lead, traveling through scorching winds. Everything appeared normal though Niji kept getting the feeling that he was missing something very important. He suddenly spotted something, or rather someone, heading towards them. 
Stop. Niji stopped along with the rest of the team skidded to a stop. Niji what is it? Henton asked. There's someone heading towards us. The group was now on guard. Eventually the person came into sight, Niji thanks to his bloodline was the first to spot the details of the person and what he saw made him want to hurl. The others saw Niji's sickening look and were now very concerned. Eventually the person came into view and what they saw also caused them to feel horrified and sickened. The person was completely naked and bloody though that wasn't the horrifying part, rather the guy had no skin. Every muscle in his body was exposed, there was virtually no skin left on him, and where his stomach should be was just some large hole. Eventually the person couldn't move forward anymore and was about to collapse. Fortunately the others snapped out their horrified state, with Guy being able to catch him on time. Unfortunately they were now able to see every last detail of this person. There was still some skin left. Particularly enough to leave the guy's cheeks and lips intact, as well his eyelids were still there, though they looked more like wet tissue paper. Every nail on his fingers and toes were ripped out, where his manhood should be was just some bloody hole, throat torn apart, the large hole on his stomach revealed every organ in there was removed, not even entrails were left, and finally what was seemingly melted into his chest was a metal plate with the symbol of Konoha on it. Oh Kami. Tenton muttered in horror. Just how is he still alive? The better question is who did this and why. Niji countered. The man suddenly opened his and with energy that no one thought he had, stood up quickly while yelling out some jumbled nonsense while trying to claw something that wasn't there. Calm down. I managed to snap the man out of his panic. The mutilated man finally noticed them. His eyes widened, making everyone think he was going to panic again until he did something completely unexpected he laughed. There was nothing joyful about this laugh, it was a laugh of hopelessness and madness. You shouldn't have come. His throat occasionally spurted blood out with each word spoken. Sir calm down, who did this to you? I asked in a surprisingly serious tone that lacked his usual youth speech. The mutilated man laughed again. The Tiger of the West. That sounded familiar though they couldn't figure out why. The know how I is going to burn. Our sins are catching up to us. I it's time too for us to pay our dues. Sir if you just calm down we can get you back to Kanoha for proper treatment. Though Guy couldn't help but wince at that. There was just no way to fix any of this. The man's eyes widened, now filled with rage and unbridled hatred. It's all a lie. The group were startled at the man's screams. Kanoha is nothing but a lie. It's just a filthy cesspool of hypocrisy and corruption. And I. He then started crying while gripping his right arm. And I was a part of it. They then heard squishy sounds along with bones breaking as he was digging into his arm, all while chuckling. I made a deal with the devil now there's no going back for me. With a loud squelch he pulled out a long dagger straight out of his arm. But surprising he leaped towards the nearest target with a manic look that target being Tenton. Denton. But it was already too late as he was already upon her. Squelch. Denton was laying ground looking at the man on top of her, completely horrified while blood spilled, but it was not her blood. The man had stabbed himself on the head. Seemingly with the last of his life he spoke his last words. You are all going to die out here. Then he finally died. What the hell? Denton muttered completely horrified at what just happened. She got the corpse off her while the others helped her to her feet. How could someone do such an unyoutful thing to another? Lee was sad and disgusted at what he witnessed. I don't know. Though something at the way he was brutalized nagged at Niji's mind, as well as what he said. Tiger of the West. Now why does that sound familiar? Everyone then heard the sounds of fighting. Regretfully they decided to leave the corpse behind to investigate. They came across an old ship where the fighting was seemingly coming from. What's a ship doing out in the middle of the desert? From what I heard this place used to be a large lake before drying out. They heard it. A roar so inhuman in nature they could feel nothing but terror and see nothing but their own deaths. It was like they heard the voice of the Shinigami itself. The sounds of fighting were ceased and replaced with the cries of fear and pain. They must be the remaining Rouge Kanohanins, and from the sounds of it they are in trouble. You three stay here while I help them. Before anyone could complain Guy was already gone, heading directly to what was most likely a slaughter. The fight was renewed once more and sounded more intense. I cannot just stand here while Guy Sensei is fighting such a frightening monster. Wait. Youth. Lee shot off to join his Sensei in the fighting. Damn it. I'm going after him. You wait here Niji. Denton. Though it was already too late to stop her. There are times like this where I regret being in a team full of headstrong people. Niji fascipumed. Right now he was trying to decide whether he should stick to his position or find a way to send a message to Kanoha for backup, which would require him to abandon his teammates. Though, again, the words from the mutilated man rang in his head. What is it that we're missing? He went through the mutilation to the words spoken. Wait a minute what he said. 
Realization dawned on him when he found out what it was, and that realization turned to horror. He noticed that everything was quiet, no fighting, no screaming, nothing. Shit. He ran off towards the ship hoping he can get there on time. He entered the ship, using his Byakugan to find any traces of his team through the darkness. Fenton Lee Sensei. He had no idea why whispered, he just feels like if he shouts it will be the end of him. As Niji looked quietly around not noticing something or rather someone looking at him with glowing crimson eyes. Niji's instincts were now screaming at him to run and not look back. Against his better instincts, he slowly turned to look only to see a crimson-haired man glaring at him with amusement. At first he had no idea who he was looking at, until he remembered the description Hinata gave him of the demon all should fear. Oda Nobunaga. He became as pale as a ghost. He was so terrified that all he could do was stand completely still. For a full minute he could do nothing but stare in fright, while Nobunaga grew more amused. Eventually Niji acted he decided to close his eyes, pretend he didn't see him, turn around and walk away. Nobunaga actually chuckled at the action before slamming Niji down onto the ground by his throat. That had quickly snapped him out of his fear-induced stupidity and quickly flipped him off. Nobunaga landed on his feet snorting at him in amusement, while Niji got off the ground and got into his tajutsu stance. Nobunaga's eyes glowed, confusing Niji. Your chakra he shivered, hearing Nobunaga's voice for the first time. Is strong, just like your friend. He held something before tossing it to the ground. Niji got a close look at it and was horrified to see it was an arm covered in a green sleeve with bandages wrapped on the hand. The turtle. Lee. Rage clouding his mind he went to attack Nobunaga, hoping to at least draw blood against the monster. Nobunaga simply held his hand in front, his middle finger held back by his thumb. His middle finger struck out connecting against Niji's abdomen. He was sent flying with great force, colliding against the wall and collapsing against the ground. He got off the ground weakly, feeling some bones of his broken while coughing at blood. What in Kami's name was that? Just from a finger. He was no starting to understand the severity of the situation and just how unclassed he really is. Don't worry little bird. He unsheathed two blades from his waist. I'll make sure your death is quick. A courtesy I won't grant to your precious leaf village. He said with a sadistic smile on his face. No. Niji throws a smoke pellet on him for distraction. Nobunaga simply turned his head slightly before smirking at the retreating Hyuga. As Niji got out he ran as fast as possible, his only thought was to get to Konoha and warn them about the tyrant's intentions. Unfortunately he was stopped as an ethereal chain came and wrapped around his leg, dragging him back to the ship. This would be last time anyone would ever see of Yuga Niji. Hokage's office. Two weeks later. Tsunade was currently staring at all the reports, for once not complaining about the tremendous paperwork or even drinking her sake. Team Guy has been gone for quite a while, which naturally got her and the others worried. Unfortunately they couldn't send any search parties without wasting resources. Plus it was only a few weeks, not enough for the council to actually be concerned. Tsunade sighed in tiredness. What am I even doing? Why am I still here? She only became Hokage because of Naruto and how much he believed in the spirit of Konoha. Yet this place was nothing but a soulless pit that was slowly being consumed by its own hunger. In all honesty she didn't stay here for Naruto since he was. She blinked her tears away, refusing to cry. And she most certainly did not stay here because of her deceased family, who foolishly gave up their freedom and lives for this place. Tsunade-sama. She looked up to see Shizune with a worried look. What is it Shizune? I have some bad news. Iwa, Kumo and Odo have completely halted their advances towards Konoha. How exactly is that bad news? It's the reason why they stopped a new army has arrived, heading towards Konoha, and the flags bear the symbol of Rakshasa. Tsunade instantly paled. He's coming isn't he? Shizune nodded her head. Shit. 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 It was one thing hearing and preparing for his arrival. It was a completely different thing knowing that he's now actually arriving. And what of Saya? We have more guards posted at her compound and made sure none of this was leaked to her. As punishment for almost endangering the village she was sentenced to house arrest for two years and completely forbidden to take any missions in that time frame. Honestly the punishment should have been far harsher, except they couldn't afford to lose any more shinobi, and like it or not Saya is the best in her generation. Has everyone else been notified? Yes Tsunade-sama. Good. Hopefully we can survive this. Ichiha compound. Ichiha Saya was currently laying on her bed looking at some old childhood pictures. She smiled at some of them that had her in embarrassing situations or ones where she was with her mother. She frowned at the ones that showed pictures of her team and outright scowled at the first team picture they've taken. The picture only served as a reminder of her greatest mistake. She scowled before ripping the picture apart. Team 7 what a joke. 
Their sensei was a perverted lazy ass who can barely teach, the third member was nothing more, but some girly girl who cared more about her looks than anything else, and the one member she could place her entire trust on was treated as trash by her. I'm really not that different from the rest of them. She had promised that she would never leave his side yet in the end that's exactly what she did. She let her hatred cloud her eyes and refused to believe that there was a light. Now that she realized its existence it was gone now never to return. And it was all because of him. Her eyes were instantly filled with hatred thinking about the most feared warlord. Thanks to him, there was no chance of ever apologizing to Naruto, no chance of trying to earn back his trust, no chance of telling him how she truly feels. Her eyes became empty, thinking about her love towards the Uzumaki, before she got off the bed. She activated a seal on the wall, causing it to open up to a hidden room. This was the Achiha Forbidden Armory, which contained numerous powerful weapons that her clan collected throughout the years, weapons that not even Achiha Madara would even think about using. The very same weapons that her clan had planned to use for the coup deaded on the leaf. Yes she is very much aware what her clan had tried to do. She also knows just about every little secret Kanoha has kept hidden including her love's heritage. She is also aware that Nobunaga is coming. She scoffed at how easy it was to obtain the information. At the end of the room was a seven-branched sword, the metal at dark silver inscribed with crimson seals. Matu Kakuryumaru is its name, and it's the very sword she is going to use to kill the demon king of the sixth heaven. Unknown. Harsh winds were blowing dust and sand everywhere. For ordinary beings this would make it difficult if not outright impossible to go through. However for the army marching through it was simply a slight annoyance. The samurai wore crimson armor and bore the marks of Rakshasa. They were all riding wolf-like creatures larger than horses, at the center of the army was a large caravan that was more akin to a miniature castle, being carried by large elephant-like beasts with human-like bodies. Inside the caravan are numerous women wearing all sorts of revealing outfits. Most of them were asleep save for a few. Nobunaga was currently tenderly kissing the former daimyo of Spring Country Koyuki. It's been quite a while since we've been able to do this. Yes it has my dear. Koyuki snuggled deeper into his embrace. Shame that not all of my wives are here right now. Koyuki smiled. Well what do you expect? A lot of them still have important duties to fulfill. Do true my dear. A lot of his wives often have important duties to fulfill, so it was actually quite rare for all of them to be together in one place as far as anyone knows. Though we still have our moments. He kissed her lips once more before she snuggled deeper into his embrace and slept. Nobunaga chuckled. His soft loving expression changed to one of violent hatred and sadism as thoughts of Kanoha invaded his head. I can't wait to watch it burn. Day of arrival. Kanoha. Tsunade, along with her assistant Shizune, were at the front gate awaiting for Nobunaga's arrival. All the civilians, elders and genins were hidden in their home, too afraid to even look out their windows. The shinobi forces who were brave enough were hidden in the shadows, preparing for the first sign that things will get chaotic. Though Shizune still wore her usual attire, Tsunade wore quite a revealing yet elegant kimono, which exposed quite a large amount of her ample bosom. Consider the reports they got from the Genin team's visit, she was hoping she could use her looks to her advantage. Although then again it may end up working against her personally considering how large his harem is. She was snapped out of her thoughts as she saw the approaching army. In truth she was a bit stunned seeing the monstrous mounts, but kept a stoic face. At the front was a horse with crimson fur and a fiery mane, the rider wore a set of interwoven metal plates over chainmail, topped by a visored barbuda helmet, and the partial plate being segmented along the torso, arm, and leg joints. The rider also was carrying some strange objects attached to a rope. The army stopped yet the horse rider continued on forward, making her realize that this warrior was most likely a top-ranked soldier, or maybe even Nobunaga himself. The rider stopped right in front of them, tossing the objects right at their feet. The objects were revealed to be skulls. More specifically the skulls of kings, daimyos, and kages. The warrior spoke, revealing to be female. The demon king has arrived Senju I hope you are prepared. The end. So how was this part, I hope you like it. And if you like it share this part with your friends and like the video too. And don't forget to subscribe our channel for daily awesome fanfiction. Okay it's time for me to go. Bye bye.